Gravity. 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 Gravity makes things fall. But on this episode, I'm doing everything I can to defy gravity. Oh, you win this one, Gravity. From a hoop glider, to an egg drop, to a hover balloon, it's a gravity-defying dance party. All on this episode of Science Max Experiments at Large. Greetings, Science Maximites. Welcome to Science Max Experiments at Large. My name is Phil, and today on Science Max, we're going to be looking at gravity. What goes up must come down. Today... <laughs> gravity is the force that makes things fall. <laughs> Towards the ground. But just because it's a force of nature doesn't mean that we have to listen to it. No! Today on Science Max, experiments at large, we're going to use everything in the power of science to defy gravity! Ha <laughs> ha! We are going to be making a hoop glider. Now, hoop gliders may not look like much, but they fly just like paper airplanes. Woohoo! And here's how you can make a hoop glider. Here's how you can make a hoop glider all your own. This is what you need. Index cards, scissors, straw, ruler, pencil, and of course, science tape, which is just like regular tape, except you use this kind of tape for science. So, here's how you do it. Take your index card and cut it into three equal lengths. Take two strips, and you take your science tape, and you tape those two strips and make a hoop out of it. And with the small strip, you want to make another hoop. Now, what you want to do is take your straw. Now, this straw has a little scoop at the end, and that's not very aerodynamic, so we're going to get rid of that. Ooh, maybe it was kind of aerodynamic. All right, now that we've got the straw, you have to align the hoop and the straw together. So here's what I like to do. Take some science tape and stick it on the straw, and then align it so that it's perfectly straight, and then stick it on. Looks straight to me, all right? The small hoop also has to be perfectly aligned with the first hoop. So again, put the tape on the strap first, then align them up, and then start looking down through it to make sure it's aligned. There. Once you have it all taped together, you're done your hoop glider. And it flies just like a paper airplane. Pew! Awesome. So that's what we're going to do today. We're going to... We're gonna, oh yeah, I gotta clean that up. We are going to max out the hoop glider. I'm gonna go meet Sonia at the Ontario Science Center and mm -hmm. we are going to max out the hoop glider into a giant version. We'll probably have to change the materials we use because oh, I don't think we can get a straw that big or cardboard, but still, we can figure it out. All right, here I go. Aha! Oh, hi, Phil! Yeah, what? Pardon? You want me to help you with an experiment? Sonia, I came in. Phil, you came are in you, here? I came are you in. okay? Are you okay? Yeah, I'm fine. Come on, let me show you. Okay. This is what I would like to max out. It was in my pocket when I fell, so. What is it, that? It, it's a hoop glider. It was a hoop glider. So, how do we max this out? First, we're gonna need a larger tube. To large replace tube. the straw, yeah. Exactly, and we're gonna need two hoops. So, we need something that's flexible that will convert into a hoop. Okay, that's great. So, uh, why don't we get started? Sounds good. All right, high fives. Right. You may recognize this. It is a spring. Yes, good for you. But did you know that springs can defy gravity? Whoa. Gravity de defy. Gravity defy. Gravity de Look at it fly. Defying. Okay, not exactly, but 
What if I was to hold the spring like this and let it go? What'll happen? It'll fall. Yes, it'll fall. That's, that is true. But while it's falling, what happens to this end? Does it stay in one place? Does it go up or does it go down? Let's find out. I'll bring this in so you can really see it. Okay, ready? Watch close. Did you see? Did you, no? Okay, tell you what. We'll watch it again, this time in slow motion. See? The bottom doesn't move, and here's why. When the top of the spring is released, gravity and the tension of the spring are pulling on it. The bottom of the spring is being pulled down by gravity and up by the tension of the spring. These forces cancel out, stopping the bottom of the spring from falling until the top reaches it. Until there's no more tension, and then the top passes the bottom and the whole thing That is how it works. But here is the real question. Will it happen differently with a longer spring? Huh? Well, I just happen to have a longer spring! Let's max it out! Don't tangle it. So, now that I'm up high on this fire escape, let's test it out. Okay, three, two, one, go! A longer spring still has the same forces working on it. The tension of the spring pulling it up and gravity pulling it down. No matter what size of spring, these forces cancel out for the bottom of the spring until the top meets up with it. So there you go, an almost gravity-defying spring! <laughs> uh, hey, there's no door handle on this door. I guess I have to take the stairs. Whoa. Sonny and I are maxing out the hoop glider out of bigger and better materials. This is the largest tube I have, right? A giant ABS pipe and some bendable metal to make into hoops. Then we attach them all together and... Okay, big hoop is done. And little hoop is also done. Awesome. Not bad. Not bad at all. Super solid. And that's the thing. We have pretty heavy materials, so it might not fly as well as we'd like. But something heavy can always be good, right? Oh, no. That's what I'm talking about. <laughs> See how solid it is? It's pretty solid. No damage whatsoever. You want to test it? I think we should. OK. I'm excited. We take our plastic and metal hoop glider outside to test it and... Ready? Ready. One, two, two three. Huh. huh. It didn't really fly, did it? Sonia and I made a very solid design, but the problem with it became pretty obvious. Yeah. It's just too heavy. Well, that's what science is. Back to the drawing board. Back. Here's something fun you can do if you ever get your hands on a helium balloon. Now, helium balloons float up, not because they defy gravity, but because they're lighter than air. It's because the heavier air around it actually falls past the balloon and that ends up pushing the balloon up. But what if this helium balloon wasn't lighter than air or heavier than air? It was exactly the same. This is what I like to do. Just take a helium balloon with a long ribbon and a bunch of paper clips and adding a little bit of weight every time. And what we want to do is make this balloon neutrally buoyant. That means it won't go up or down but it will be neutral. You want to check it every once in a while. Let's see, three paper clips is clearly not enough. Five paper clips is, ooh, five paper clips is pretty close. It still might float down. So you want to take off just a little bit of weight, maybe about there. Watch this. You just take the balloon and you put it somewhere and it stays. It stays put. It doesn't go up. It doesn't go down. It's attached to nothing. Now, let's max it out. Huh. I had a big balloon, and it was a, uh, we had a, oh. 
There. <laughs> a giant balloon. And look, it's a great paper towel delivery device. Say, did you want some paper towel? Here you go. Science. Yeah, don't worry about Ramona. Just put him up high. Put him up, yeah, higher. Good. Hey. Gravity. Wham. Gravity makes things fall. Well, where do they fall? They fall down. Oh. Towards the center of the Earth. Gravity. It fell, didn't it? So, the Earth causes gravity, right? Well, yes. Gravity! Oh, not... come on. Everything that has mass has gravity. Gravity! But the Earth has so much mass that the gravity produced by everything else is like nothing. I mean, forget about it. But let's say I was in space with, uh, with this chicken. <laughs> I would have gravity, and I could exert a gravitational force on this chicken. And if I get my angles right, I might be able to get the chicken to orbit me. Like, like a moon. Behold, my chicken moon. Huh? Gravity. But let's get serious. What causes gravity? We don't know. Ah! But what we do know is that without gravity, there would be no universe as we know it. No you, no me, no chicken moon. I'd miss my chicken moon. Chicken moon, you what? Gravity. Like it or not, the universe wouldn't exist without it. You like the sign? I'll give you a good deal. Uh, half off. Back to our hoop glider, which was... Too heavy. Here's what I don't get. This is heavy, but I can still pick it up and throw it. Yeah. An airplane is way heavier. I could never pick up an airplane, but that can fly. And that's because airplanes have engines, so it has a constant source of thrust. When we throw it, we just have an initial source of thrust. So we're throwing it, eventually loses its energy, therefore, it falls to the ground. I see. So we need something that's light. Light. And something that's strong. And strong. OK, well, let's see what we can find. All right. Sonia and I try a plastic tube and some heavy-duty paper. We make hoops and attach them with some duct tape and run outside to try it out. Hoop glider dance! Okay, three, two, one! Yeah! Yeah! That's pretty good! That was pretty amazing! Good. Let's try that again. <laughs> Here we go! I throw the hoop glider, and although it doesn't keep flying forever, it goes much further than our first version, and also further than I could have just thrown the pipe by itself. Pretty good! So we've done a good job of making something that flies. Why don't we make a couple different kinds out of different materials, and we'll see if we can get one that flies even better than this. I think that's a good idea. Yeah, okay, let's do it. <laughs> Sonia and I have created a pretty good maxed out hoop glider, but we wanted to see if different materials would make an even better one. Sonia made a much lighter version. This time I used cardboard. And I, I made this, made a slightly heavier one. Let's do it. Okay, three, yeah. two, one, go! Not bad. My turn. Here we go. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that didn't really go very far at all, did it? No. OK, so now we can measure it against the one that we threw before. And see that went pretty far. This went pretty far to see yeah. if we've got a better design here. Here we go. Right? Wow. Awesome! So, heavy one, no. Light one, no. Interesting. Uh, no. This design seems to be the best one. I keep thinking about how you were talking about thrust. Yep. All the thrust that we can put in is just what we can put in with one throw. Yeah. What if we could give it more thrust than that? How can we do that? Um, I don't know, like some sort of uh, slingshot or something. Like, a, it'd have to be a pretty big slingshot. A pretty though. big slingshot. Do you think but I can think make that it? sounds great, though. I think we make a big slingshot for this? Why not? OK, high five. Let's All do right. it. This is an egg. Eggs do not like to be dropped. 
Oh, fortunately, we can use the power of science to design something that'll keep the egg safe as it falls. Behold, my egg drop contraptions. The thing I really like about this experiment is there's no wrong way to do this. You can come up with any design you want and see if it works. This one here is a bunch of helium balloons. This structure is just to keep the helium balloons on so the egg can touch down very gently. Here it goes. Whoa. <laughs> and, and the egg is unharmed. Miraculously sound. That one worked really well. Success. This is a giant helium balloon that I think will work pretty much the same way because I think this balloon will drop just slowly enough that the egg can actually just touch and nothing will happen. Um, so that didn't work. <laughs> and then there's this one, which has no slowing at all. It's all designed to just absorb the impact. And the idea is that the cone will crumple and absorb the force when it hits the bottom. Oh, no! Oh, <laughs> no. I think it would have worked if it hadn't turned in the air, but it did, and, well, I guess the egg is completely broken. So I'd call that one a fail. This one is the parachute. You see the egg has been nestled into this foam container, and this is a parachute that will hopefully slow the egg down. Woo! Uh-oh. Whoa. Over. Over. Good. And ah, <laughs> that one seemed to work well. Yep, the egg is totally fine. <laughs> the parachute worked. All right, egg drop experiment. Totally fun experiment to do. But the question is, how do we max it out? And the answer is pumpkin drop. <laughs> Same thing, except with a pumpkin instead of an egg. Come on. OK. Ha, ha, ha. All right, pumpkin drop with everything attached all at once. OK, here we go. Ready? One, two, three. So what we've learned from this is the heavier something is, the more force is acting on it from gravity, which means the harder it is to slow down when it's falling. OK, fair enough. You win this one, Gravity, but I'll beat you next time. I'm, I'm gonna get a broom. Being a chef is my absolute passion, and cooking up science recipes is my speciality. I'm Buster Beaker, and this is Cooking with Science. Oh, hello. Welcome to Cooking with Science. I'm Buster Beaker. Delicious. Nothing is more important to have fresh than your seafood. It's what makes the difference between a fresh fish... <laughs> ah, ...and one that isn't so fresh. <laughs> <coughs> if you live by the ocean, you probably know that the water gets high tide and low tide. Look closely, it's the same location. Amazing! Oh. But did you know that this is caused by the gravity of the moon and the sun? Say this cookie is the Earth. And this little happy fellow is me. Hello! <laughs> and this string represents the water around the Earth. If we didn't have gravity to worry about, the water would all be equally deep around the Earth. But here comes the moon, this mushroom. Now, the moon has gravity, and that pulls the oceans towards it a little bit, like this. And that creates high tide there, low tide here, and a little bump of high tide on the other side of the Earth. And as the Earth rotates and I'm on it, I experience low tide and high tide, and low tide and high tide. Very interesting. But there's another factor. The sun, or this lemon. Now, the sun also affects the tides, but not as much as the moon. Now, the sun does not affect the tides as much as the moon because it's much further away, but it still has an effect. If the sun was here, then the tides would be pulled away a little bit like that, and the tides would be less severe. But if the moon and the sun line up, like over here, you'd get a very, very high tide and very, very low tide. So there you are. That's how the tides are affected by the gravity of the moon and the sun. Mmm, delicious. 
I'm Buster Beaker, and thank you for joining me on Cooking with Science. Our maxed out hoop glider was working pretty well. That was pretty amazing. Good. Here we go. But we could only give it so much thrust by throwing it. Yeah. So we came up with the perfect science max solution. Our giant slingshot! <laughs> All right. We pull the bungee cord back and hook it onto our hoop glider. I am ready to fire. Count me down. Three, two, launch it! <laughs> Our slingshot is amazing. By giving the glider more thrust, that is, more energy at the beginning so it's going faster when we launch it, the glider soars through the air and flies a long way. That was great! So there you go, giant hoop glider! Yeah! Science Max! Experiments at large, nicely done. Nice. What more could you ask for? Well, it's my turn! Hey, see you next time! Today, we're moving air. We're moving it through a tube to make a stomp rocket, vacuuming it out, turning it into a vortex, and taking it with us underwater. All on this episode of Science Max Experiments at Large. That was amazing! Greetings, Science Maximites. My name is Phil, and it's moving day today on Science Max Experiments at Large. Let's see, where do I put this? Uh, this is probably a good spot. <laughs> Today, we are moving air. You probably don't think that moving air will have a huge effect, but you'd be surprised what you can do by just moving air. But don't worry, we're not just gonna move the air around in boxes. We are going to build a rocket! And this rocket uses the science of stomping on something with your foot. This is a stomp rocket, and it works by stomping on this plastic bottle, and air shoots through this tube and pushes the rocket up into the sky. And here is how you can build one of your very own. And remember, if I go too fast, don't worry. All of the steps are on the website, so you can follow along at your own speed. All you need is a two-liter plastic bottle, three kinds of tape electrical tape, duct tape, and science tape. Science tape is just the same as invisible tape, but I use this kind of tape for science. Then you want some plumber's tubing and some construction paper to make your actual rocket. First, you want to take your plumber's tubing and cut it into three lengths. And when I say you, I mean an adult, because you need to use a saw. So you saw it up into a long piece, a short piece, and an elbow piece. We want to make a long tube at the top, and then we also want to make a tube at the bottom so we can attach our two-liter bottle to. And there we go. Ta-da! Ready to go. But of course, it doesn't stay up, so we have to attach it to a base. And it will look like this. And you see, it's been attached with duct tape here, and I've used electrical tape, and I've wrapped that part around there. Now, building the rocket. Wrap the paper around the tube and tape it with your science tape. Tape the top closed so no air escapes. Then cut a semicircle to make the nose cone and three hoops for thrusters and tape them to the bottom. There you go. The rocket fits on the tube just like that. And when you stomp on this bottle, it launches. But here's the most important part. The one most important rule of launching rockets. You shoot rockets outside. Come on. Once you get outside to a nice open area and you bring your safety glasses with you, all you need to do to make the stomp rocket work is, of course, stomp on it. You ready? Here we go. Three, two, one. Whoa! Did you see that? That was amazing. Okay, so this is where we're gonna start with the stomp rocket. I'm gonna meet Chris from Logics Academy, and he's gonna help me max it out. In fact, he's probably at Science Max headquarters already. I should get over there. Okay, where's the... Oh, there it is. Okay. How you doing? It's good to see you. You too. Chris is from Logics Academy, and you guys do in-class robotics workshops, right? That's right, we do. Great. Well, I was hoping I could get your expertise to help me max out the stomp rocket. Yeah, Logics makes one of these. I totally think I can help you with that. Fantastic. So it works great. I just want to make it 
bigger, better, more maxed out. First off, we can start by making this pipe a little bit bigger. So a larger pipe, more airflow, uh, bigger launch. Okay, let's do it. Cool. Moving air isn't that hard, right? I mean, air is super light. How hard can it be to move? Well, here's an experiment you can do that lets you measure how hard it is to move air. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna hit the ruler with the broom. It's gonna go over there. I hit it and it moved, no problem. So we're gonna do it again, except I'm gonna add just a couple pieces of newspaper. All right, ready? Aha, the ruler broke, because this time, I wasn't just moving the ruler, I wasn't just moving the ruler and the newspaper, I had to move the ruler, the newspaper, and all of the air that was on top of the newspaper. And that resistance was enough to break the ruler. Pretty good experiment, right? Let's max it out. I've got more table space, I've got a piece of lumber, and instead of a newspaper, I have a tarp. Now the tarp is very light. It is not the weight of the tarp that is going to be the difference. It is how much air I need to move when I hit this piece of lumber. And I've got a Science Max hammer. So first of all, you're not gonna try this at home, right? Deal? Okay, deal. No trying this at home. Okay, here we go. Moving air, test 2.0. <laughs> it broke, and it didn't even move. Did you see that? I wonder if we can max this out even more. Two by four, which is much bigger than the piece of wood we used last time, and a sledgehammer! Here we go, moving air experiment 3.0. Yeah, science. So I've joined Chris from Logix Academy and we are maxing out our stomp rocket. To do that, we're gonna use... Larger pipe more airflow, bigger launch. The theory is that moving a larger volume of air through wider pipes will make our rocket work even better. So we get to work. This version is built exactly the same. We cut and attach the pipes, so one, a long piece, an elbow, like and a short piece, like then secure them all down. We attach the plastic water bottle and tape it so it's airtight, and then the only thing to do is make a new rocket that fits over the larger pipe. Ready to try it? I'm ready to try it. All right, let's do it. Let's go. One, two, three, go! <laughs> that was amazing! In the end, though it worked, it wasn't much better than the smaller rocket. I think we could still do better, right? Oh, yeah. This is science max, not science medium. Right, okay, let's go back to Science Max headquarters. Mini Max! Vacuum sealing. That's what you call it when you take all of the air out of something, often a bag, to seal in the freshness of food. I will demonstrate using this Science Max banana. 100% banana, but with added science. Not all bananas contain science. Here's how you can do it at home. Put your food in a bag, seal it most of the way, because we have to take out the air from the bag. And we will do that with a straw. Put a straw inside the bag, and then we'll suck the air out of the bag, and then seal it at the very last second. <laughs> there, a vacuum sealed banana. Now I know it's kind of hard to see that it's been vacuum sealed because bananas don't really crush much when you take the air out. So I like to use stuff that has a lot of air in it to begin with. In fact, there are special bags that are specifically for vacuum sealing that are supposed to store big and bulky items that have a lot of air in them like this pillow. See this nozzle right here? It's designed to be used with a vacuum. <laughs> so what you do is you put the vacuum on this nozzle, open it up, and then you turn the vacuum on. Oh. 
The vacuum is sucking all the air out of the bag, just like we did with the banana. But because the pillow is full of air as well, it starts to shrink and shrink. Then you pull off the vacuum and you tie the seal off and, all right, and ta-da, a vacuum sealed pillow. Okay, let's max it out. What could possibly be more maxed out than a vacuum sealed pillow? Vacuum sealed fill. Okay, I put plastic bags against the door and then sealed the edges with duct tape. And of course, I didn't put any plastic over my head because you never put your head in a plastic bag, right? Well, let's see if vacuum sealed fill it works. Whoa. Hey, it's working! <laughs> the vacuum sucks all the air from the bag, which seals the bag and me in it to the wall. That means I should be able to knock this milk crate out from under me. Air pressure, or the lack of air pressure, is keeping me sealed to the door. I'm completely suspended. <laughs> Uh-oh, I shouldn't have done that. <laughs> no. So our larger version of the Stomp Rocket worked, but it didn't go as high as the first version. Chris and I see how we can improve the design. The larger pipe and the larger rocket works really well. It does work really well. I am afraid, though, that the larger pipe means that the same amount of air is flowing slower out the nozzle than it did before. Oh, so because we're moving only this much air, it's not going to go as fast because this is a bigger tube. We need a bigger volume over here to match our larger So uh, a nozzle. bigger bottle. That's right. I got a bigger bottle right here. Ha-ha! Bigger bottle! <laughs> So um, hold that, and uh, then all we have to do is tape the bigger bottle. I'm not sure on. If that's gonna. Yeah, like this. Still though, I'm afraid. Yeah. A so then bit. all I need to do is tape it on. Chris and I attach a larger bottle to our tube. We just need some risers to adjust the height. Then we tape it on, and we're good to go. Everything else, including the rocket, stays the same. I still don't understand how you're gonna step on this one. It's just too stiff. I, I have a plan. <laughs> Sledgehammer. You ready? Yeah, I'm ready. Okay. One, two, three! <laughs> <laughs> it blew the top off the rocket. Right off it the also top. blew the bottom. Huh. Looks like it's a bit rigid to uh, change its volume so quickly. So it's kind of a one-time use thing, huh? I think so. So why don't we try increasing the volume? Even bigger tube, yeah. even bigger uh, container. What's bigger than a, that? That's the biggest bottle they make. It's what else holds air? What about an air mattress? Do you think we could use an air mattress? I think we could, yeah. A really big air mattress. Oh, totally. High five. All I right. love that idea. <laughs> Moving air is a lot of fun, especially if you use one of these, a vortex cannon. They're pretty impressive and they use some pretty amazing science. I'll show you how to build one. It's pretty simple. All you need is a plastic cup. You want a balloon, something round, an elastic, scissors or a craft knife, and a pen. Here's what you do. Take your balloon and cut it just where it gets wide. You take the mouth of the cup right there and you have to stretch the balloon over the top. And then you want to put an elastic around it, keep it in place. And this now is a surface on the top. And that's what you're going to use to pull back and create your burst of air. But of course, the air is not going to go anywhere until you make a hole in the bottom. So here's what you do. You take your round thing and draw a circle and take your craft knife or scissors and an adult and get them to help you cut out a hole. And when you pull back on the balloon, a burst of air comes through the hole, but the air has an interesting shape. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, Phil, air is invisible. You can't tell what shape it is. Well, I can show you. Come on. This is my maxed out vortex cannon. It's made out of a garbage can. I've got a hole in here, and this is a shower curtain with a ball that I can get a grip on and pull. And then it shoots forward like this. Now, it makes a big puff of air, but again, the air is invisible, so we don't know what shape it is, but I can help with that because I've got this, a fire! 
fog machine. I fill the inside of the garbage can so we can see what the air is doing when I fire the vortex can. OK, come on over here. Ready? Whoa. OK, ready? Check it out. The vortex cannon shapes the air into a ring called a vortex. It makes a ring. Well, actually, sort of a donut. Because of its shape, the air in a vortex can move much farther than air that doesn't have a shape. Vortex cannon. Air that has a shape goes a lot further than air that doesn't have a shape. And it's also way more fun. Woohoo! Okay, now that's too far left. I don't know what you think. Oh, hey, I don't suppose you're going on vacation anytime soon. Well, if you haven't decided where, may I suggest underwater. But don't forget to pack the most important thing when you go. Hat? Nah. Ukulele? Nah, forget about it. Oh, chicken? No. Sunscreen? Forget about it. Teddy? No, if you're going underwater, the most important thing you've got to pack is air. Hmm? You see, human beings have been coming up with ways to go underwater for a long time. But the thing is, you've got to bring air with you because, you know, breathing is, is good. <gasps> Check this out. It's a diving bell. One of the first ways humans used to be able to take air with them when they went underwater. You see, it's a big, heavy bell, and it's lowered from a ship above on a rope. And when it gets lowered into the water, it traps a bubble of air underneath. So you can swim around underwater, but then when you need to breathe again, you don't have to go all the way back up. You just pop under the bell and take another breath. <sighs> Bells like this were actually much bigger when they used to use them for diving to hold more air. Huh? Ring-a-ding-ding. -ding. What do you think? You want this? No? Uh, it's OK. I got something else. Hold on. Check this out. It's an old-timey diving suit. Air is pumped in through these hoses here, which means the diver has a constant supply of air, which means he can stay underwater longer. What do you think? You, like, no? OK, hold, hold on. I got something else. I got something else. Uh, um, uh, yeah. This is it, the ultimate in bringing air with you. The scuba suit, this tank, holds compressed air, which means it can carry a lot of air with you, which means you can stay underwater for longer. So I'll tell you what, I'll wrap up all three things. What do you say? Yeah, you'll take them? OK, great. Let me just wrap them up for you. Come on, Teddy, let's go find the bag. So our large stop rocket hasn't worked perfectly. A small bottle didn't move enough air, but our larger bottle was too rigid to stop. And when I used a sledgehammer, it was so sudden the bottle broke and also blew apart the rocket. Chris and I need a large container of air that is soft enough to change its shape easily. So here's the current plan. An even larger pipe, an even larger rocket, and we use an air mattress. We make two holes in the air mattress, one to fill it up with a leaf blower, and the other hole to go out the tube to the rocket. Since an air mattress holds lots of air and is very easy to change the shape by jumping on it, we figure it'll be a great way to get lots of air through the tube to launch our rocket. OK, let's do it. Let's do it. All right, we're going to go one, two, three, jump, right? Okay, yeah. One, two, three. Being a chef is my absolute passion. And cooking up science recipes is my speciality. I'm Buster Beaker, and this is Cooking with Science. Ah. Oh, hello. Welcome to Cooking with Science. I'm Buster Beaker. Whenever friends come over, I like to make my famous potato chip recipe. And look at this bag of potato chips. Quite large. There must be a lot of potato chips in here, right? Well, let's open it. What? This potato chip bag is mostly air. Why do potato chip bags have so much air? Well, to tell you the answer to that, I have to tell you the story of two bags of potato chips. Here they are. 
this one full of air, and this bag of potato chips, there's not much air in it at all. Why don't they make them like this? Well, let's find out. First thing that happens is the potato chip bags come off the conveyor belt at the potato chip factory where they get packed into a crate. Here's a crate here. So let's really stuff them in. And then the crate gets boxed up and shipped off to the store. Oh, it's a bumpy ride to the store today. Now we're at the store. And then you come along. Ah, bags of potato chips. What else should I buy today? Oh, I know. How about a cantaloupe? Very nice. Some apples, yes? And take it home, walk along, and you get to the kitchen. You have a choice. This bag of potato chips, where all the potato chips are light and fluffy, or this bag of potato chips, which is not exciting at all. And that's why potato chip bags have so much air, to protect the potato chips from getting crushed. Speaking of potato chips, time to get back to my recipe. What is it? It's potato chip soup. Well, hi, Master Beaker, and thanks for joining me on Cooking with Science. Perhaps a little bit more cooking. <laughs> Okay, so where were we? Oh, right, our maxed out rocket. A much larger pipe, a large air mattress, and the largest rocket yet. Let's see how it goes. One, two, three, jump. One, two, three. Whoa! Yeah! All right, let's do it again. Okay. One, two, three. <laughs> It works amazingly well. The large volume of air Chris and I can move by both jumping on the air mattress gets transferred through the large pipe, and even though it's a giant rocket, it sails higher than any other version. That was great. That was amazing. All right. There you go. Science Max, experiments at large, moving a lot of air. That has to be the biggest stomp rocket ever. Biggest stomp rocket ever. Let's do it again. OK. OK. This episode of Science Max is all about building things strong. Two. And let's do three. An arched bridge, giant house of cards, magical stacking books, and more. Oh, I thought they were going to do it. All on this episode of Science Max Experiments at Large. Oh, hello, Science Maximites. We've got a lot of work today, so I was just getting prepared. You know, taking something flimsy and making it strong, that's what scientists and engineers do every day. And it's also pretty fun. You take something that's not that strong, and by the way you build it or put it together or change its shape, it suddenly becomes a lot stronger than you think it was. So I thought that's what we should do today on Science Max Experiments at Large. We should build something. So we're gonna build an arched bridge, and we're gonna build it out of Sugar cubes! <laughs> so here's what you need. You need some sugar cubes, you need some sandpaper, and you need some modeling clay. So first, you want to make some abutments out of your modeling clay. What is an abutment, you ask? It is this! They distribute the force laterally from one side or the other. I like to use this. This is half a roll of duct tape, and so it fits in just like that, and you see, it's a perfect arch. If you just take sugar cubes and you try to stack them into an arch, it's not going to work because the sugar cubes may not even fit all together, and you can see only the bottoms are touching. I take up the guide and it all falls apart. So here's what you do. You take your sandpaper and you change the squares into trapezoids, and you start sanding down your sugar cubes into trapezoids. Basically, you want one small side and one long side. Thin at the top, wide at the bottom. Or wide at the top, thin at the bottom. It's a trapezoid no matter which way you hold it. Put it on the bridge and see. And as you go, you will see if you're doing it right, there will be no gaps. If you go to the Science Max website, there will be a guide that you can use to help you make the sugar cube bridge so you don't have to spend as long as I did making this one. And then the most important part is the keystone. That's the one that fits in right at the top, just like that. And when it does, you can take away the guide and it stays up. Isn't that cool? 
It stays up without any glue, without any mortar, all based on the shape of these sugar cubes. The cool thing is, it'll hold the weight of a whole car, provided you have a very, very small car. The reason why it works is because the weight is distributed along the arch into the abutments and down into the ground. That's what makes an arch bridge so strong. And that's what we're gonna do today. We're gonna max out an arch bridge. So I think I'm gonna need some help though. Uh, maybe Sonia from the Ontario Science Center. She really knows her stuff. Um, yeah, I'll go there and I'll see if she's busy. All right, come on, let's go. Sonia. Hey, Phil, how's it going? It's going good. I was wondering if you could give me a hand with something. Okay, what's I'm, up? I'm building, um, well, it's actually, it's easier if I show you. All right. Do you mind coming back to Science Max headquarters? We can take the portal. But that thing doesn't always work. Oh, it is fine. Well, I mean, that worked just fine. Uh-oh, it usually makes a beeping when I do, oh. It's out of batteries. Oh, I told myself, Phil, charge the, Charge the remote before you leave the lab, and then I... Where have you been? The, Three? The, Three? Three? The remote ran out of battery, so I had to run the last three kilometers. Sorry. You I, made um, it. Long story. So the sugar cube bridge. You had a chance to look at it, right? Uh -huh. This works on any scale, mm -hmm. right? It should, any no matter scale. what size arch, it should be the same, right? Definitely. Good, because what I want to do is use these abutments, but go to these abutments. Oh. So I'm going to start the bridge here, and I've already created a thing that to we can use to put the, support? the sugar cubes on as we go up so that we can make sure that it becomes no, a Phil. perfect arch. Yeah. Do we have enough sugar for this? Yep. I got tons of sugar. Whoa. Yeah. So I think. We're gonna need some glue because it's gonna be really hard to get these to stay. Yep. To stay, stay right on. there without a little bit of glue. We're gonna make a giant arch, maybe some walls, and and we'll see what happens. Let's do it. Oops. Uh an egg. Now you might think of eggs as kind of flimsy, and they do break pretty easily, but eggs, <laughs> eggs are actually stronger than you think. It's because they're, well, egg-shaped. You see, the top of the egg is like a little bit of an arch, and the bottom of the egg is also like an arch, and arches distribute the weight, just like they do in a bridge. Here's how you can experiment with how strong eggs are. First, you want to get a pair of gloves to protect your hands from the shell, just in case anything goes wrong. You should also tell an adult that you're doing this experiment because if it does go wrong, you're gonna have some mess to explain. And also, you should probably put on some safety glasses. Now, here's what you do. Take your egg and carefully put it in your palm just like that. And put it against your other palm and you're gonna push in directly on either side of the egg. Start pushing harder and harder. You can even lace your fingers and press even harder. And if you do it right, the egg won't break. Pretty amazing, right? So just how much weight does an egg hold? Can one egg support my entire weight? Let's find out. I'm gonna lift my weight up like this and lower myself down. And no, cannot hold my weight. Can my weight be supported by two eggs? Oh, nope. Phil's weight, four eggs. <laughs> oh, I thought they were going to do it. Nope. My weight? on eight eggs. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Huh? <laughs> My weight can be supported by just eight eggs. Science! <laughs> Whoa, careful. Sonia and I are on a quest to make a maxed out sugar cube bridge. 
The reason why an arch works is because the weight or the load of whatever's on top of the bridge is carried outward along the curve of the arch to the abutments at each end, which carry the load and keep the ends of the bridge from spreading out. No matter what you build your bridge out of, sugar or stone, the science stays the same. Sony and I are building a much larger bridge out of sugar cubes. We're using glue to help the sugar cubes stay together, just like stone bridges use mortar. And when we're finished, it was pretty impressive. A massive sugar cube bridge, yep. right? High fives for that. The moment of truth comes when we take out the support oh. and... Yeah! yeah. Awesome. Marks. Okay. Giant nice. okay. sugar cube bridge. So do you think it'll hold some weight? I think it definitely should, because right now we have an arch, mm -hmm. perfect arch and the weight is being distributed to the sides of the base, so. So that's what it's for, right? We it's, can put weight on there? We can definitely put some weight. One to start? Let's start off with one. Okay. And let's see how it goes. All right. Here we go. All right. Yeah, one book, yeah. All right, Sugar Cube Bridge. One book. Two books. Are you nervous? Yeah! <laughs> sugar, books. Sugar Cube Bridge, three books. Three books. Oh, that was great. It, it held up three books. Three. Well, technically it held up two books and broke on the third. So it's kind of still far from how much weight we want to hold because we want to cross it. We definitely want to cross it, so that means we need something bigger and stronger. The cube yeah, works. You're right, because the cubes are great because that keeps the science the same. Yep. Right? So something cubular. The milk crate, really? Definitely. I think we should use those. It's a cube. It is a cube. A whole bunch of milk crates, and we'll see what we can do. I think that sounds great. Awesome. Whoa. This is a Prince Rupert's drop. It's a piece of glass that has a long, snaky tail and a bulb at one end. So what's so interesting about a glass tadpole? Well, I'll show you, and remember, this is just glass. Oh, Prince Rupert's drops are very strong, almost as strong as steel. It's all in how they're made. Molten glass is dropped into cold water. What happens is the outer part of the drop cools off first, leaving the inner part still hot. When the inner part eventually cools, it contracts, pulling everything in tighter and tighter, keeping it under a lot of tension. And because it's round, the force you put on it is distributed all the way around, just like the force is distributed on an arched bridge. Until you get to the tail. Just the tiniest break in the tail, and... It explodes. All that energy is released in a chain reaction. Why it's so strong you can hammer on one end, but explodes when you break the other, puzzled scientists for centuries. But now we know it's all in how it's made. The Wizard Academy. All you have to do is demonstrate true magic, and you will be granted entry. Send in the next applicant. <laughs> okay, don't let them see you. Don't let them see you. Okay, magic smoke. And here we go, big entrance. Behold, it is I, Overwhelm. You again. I only have to demonstrate magic one time, and you have to let me into the Wizard Academy. And last, last time does not count. So prepare for your mind to be boggled and your eyes to also be boggled because I shall do a trick. I will just get to it. Here is a book, behold! And now, feast your stupefaction as I produce another book, ha ha! And then, two or three more times, behold, as I put, as I, that's good, behold! And now, look upon the wonderment as I stack these books on top of each other, like this, and now, feast more stupefaction as I, I cleverly move the books off the table. And now, now comes the magic word. Now, I say the magic word. The magic word! And behold, the book is levitating. It is completely off the table. I have done it. Magic 
No. No? Not magic, that's science. But the book is levitating. No. Look at it, it's not even touching the table. No, it's being supported by the books below because of the center of mass. Preposterous. I'm afraid it's very posterous. Each book is balanced on the one below in a way that the center of mass is behind the edge of the book below. And the entire stack's center of mass is behind the edge of the table. So it may look like magic, but it's science. So... I can't get into the Wizard Academy? No, I'm afraid not. I, uh, good... Alakazam! You will rule the day that Overwhelmo did not. I will return, and then you will see... Oh, ow. Sony and I made a large bridge out of sugar cubes, and it didn't hold much weight. So now we're gonna try making another arch bridge, but instead of sugar cubes, we're gonna use milk crates. There we go. I've made some abutments out of giant crates, and this is where we're gonna start our bridge, and they start there, and it goes in a big arch, but we're gonna be using... I brought milk crates! Milk crates, high fives, Woo! high fives. Two. So we start our bridge, this is a straight line, it's not, a, it's not an arch. It's not an arch. But it's clear we have a problem. Okay, ready? Oh! That didn't work, though. <laughs> we're like, it's like we're back to the beginning again. So this is like two straight lines. Yeah, two it's, straight lines, it's yep. It's like a triangle. We need an arch, so we're gonna need a support. Sony and I build a support to help us make a curve the milk crates can follow. But after we finish stacking, there is a problem. It doesn't look very solid. Yeah, it doesn't, does it? Here. Oh, yeah. Because everything is, there's a gap at the top of all of them. Look, that one, there's a gap. There's a That's gap there. there. There's a big there's a gap one there. here. It's well, not I mean, making our bridge very solid. There's only one way to find out for sure. You can try it. Is to pull this out and see if it stands up. Let's do it. Okay. So, didn't stay up. Didn't stay up. Okay. That's all right, though. I'm not sure why it isn't staying up. Like, the sugar cubes were cubes. Mm -hmm, that's a cube. Milk crates are cubes. But we did change the shape of the cube. Oh, yeah. yeah! If you remember, when I first built my sugar cube bridge, it didn't work with cubes. You have to sand the cubes down to make them into trapezoids. You can't build a perfect arch out of cubes. So they were tall, wider here and then narrower there so that they had Oh, so that's the problem. Yep. So I could, like, cut it? I could cut it. I you could cut could. it. You could. I could that's cut it. That's going to take a long time, though. If we cut the milk crates into trapezoids, everything will work, right? Right? We take a milk crate, and with the right safety gear, we cut it so we can reshape it into a trapezoid. Good. And it works, but... It's going to take a long time, isn't it? Definitely. So uh. how about this? I have an idea. So remember when we did the experiment and we had lots of V gaps? Yeah. How about we put some wooden wedges into those gaps to make it one secure structure? So they, it was sitting like this. Exactly. So what we're going to do is insert wooden pieces right here so we'll fill those gaps. I get it. And we'll make it one secure structure. Ah, okay. instead of cutting all of our milk crates, we can keep the milk crates. Yep. And they can be solid and we just add to it rather than take Taken away. Taken away, exactly. That is a smart idea. Okay, so let's make some wedges. All right. Oh, hey, how you doing? Let me guess, you want to build a strong structure, something that'll stand the test of time. Well, you know you got to use the right kind of shapes. Look at this, a square. Now, squares have got to be strong, right? Well, maybe. Maybe if you press straight down on it, but watch as I push to the side. Oh, no! The thing that I have built is now collapsing because squares aren't, in fact, strong after all. If only I had listened to Sal's sage advice. Yeah. Squares aren't gonna cut it. Fortunately, there's a shape that's strong in all kinds of ways. A triangle. Okay, so you heard of triangles before, good for you. But look at this. You can push down from the top and it doesn't move, or you can push from the side and it doesn't move. Triangles are awfully pointy. How do I build with them? Observe, ha <laughs> ha. Triangle here, triangle there, platform on top. And watch. <clears throat> No matter how I try to shift it, it stays solid. And check this out. 
triangle here, second triangle there, and a third triangle shape here. That's like three triangles for the price of two, huh? That's a good deal. So there you have it, the triangle. One of the greatest shapes to build with. This is a house of cards, and if you've never built a house of cards, you should definitely try. Try, because it's not easy. What you need to do is you need to make triangles with the cards. If you do it just right, ha ha, they'll stay up. Then you take another pair of cards, like that, and you take another card and you put it on top. Ah, and it stays up. Keep on building by making triangles and putting another card across the top like a roof. Then, when you're ready, you can start to make a second layer. It takes a lot of patience to make a house of cards. But with enough patience and really steady hands, you might be able to finish it. There we go. Ha ha, a house of cards. Now, let's max it out. Shh, backing away slowly. Backing away slowly. To build our maxed out card house, the Science Max build team and I used large pieces of foam insulation, which were super light and easy to work with. Once we set up the first layer, we needed to bring in a scissor lift so we could keep building the next layers. By the time we got to the top, our card house was 10 meters tall. Yeah, giant house of cards. And now that I've built a giant house of cards, what do I do with it? I knock it down. I'm gonna build it again. <laughs>